Hey, fellows. Um, it's really good to be able to uh, speak uh, to you all. Uh, so as you may know, I'm one of the organizers of the fellowship. I'm also a fifth year PhD student at Stanford. Um, and so what I'll be sharing with you guys is one of the first uh, papers that I published during my PhD. It took about maybe the first uh, year and a half for us to actually develop the method, do all of the experiments and publish it. Um, but ultimately, uh, we published it um, in the Nature Communications Journal. Um, and so the method was called Contrastive PCA and it's joint work. So it was with a few other students, Martin and Vivek who were students at Stanford at that time, and as well as my advisor, James Zone. So um, we'll probably have one of these research talks every seminar that we hold. And the goal of these research talks is not necessarily so much more the specific method because it may or may not be relevant to what you're doing. But the goal is to figure to, to, to take a look at what the kind of the story of doing a research project from the very beginning to the end. And oftentimes when you see one of these research talks, it looks very like, you know, you might have lots of questions like how did you get that idea or how did you know to do that experiment? And so what I'm going to hope as I'm giving this talk is I'm going to try to explain some of those questions, answer some of those questions that might come to your mind. But please ask any questions that you have during my presentation. So I'm gonna to try to take maybe about 15 minutes, but if you have questions, just please ask them and that way I'll answer them through my talk. You don't have to wait till the end. All right, sounds good? Okay, let's get started. Um, all right, so I'm gonna start with by talking about PCA first. Um, so PCA is something that probably you, many of you guys have seen before. It's a dimensionality reduction technique. You take points that you have in high dimensions. So let's say you've collected a data set of many, many different genes. So here I have three different genes, but you could have hundreds or thousands of different genes. You collect it and you want to visualize that data. Well, we humans are not very good at visualizing anything more than three dimensions. And really we like two dimensions if we can get two dimensions. So PCA is a way to take this high dimensional data and put it on a two dimensional plane or a smaller dimensional plane such that you keep most of the information, okay? And oftentimes you might have clusters that are hard to see in three dimensions, but when you put them in two dimensions, oh, you see clear, very clear clusters in your data, okay? Um, so PCA is very commonly used. And one of the things that I recommend when you guys are thinking about your own research projects and so on is, um, you know, try to connect your idea, the problem that you're solving to, a, to an existing technique. Because then people, and everybody knows, like every, you know, most machine learning people study PCA, and so they'll be interested in something you know, that connects to PCA. Um, and they'll be able to situate your research, your work in the proper context. Okay. Um, so PCA is very widely used. Um, it's you know, an unsupervised method. You use it for trying to find clusters in your data or other things. Um, but it makes one really important assumption. And if you know the, the math behind PCA, which I won't really get into too much for this talk, the big assumption is that the most important directions or dimensions in your data are the ones with the highest variance. So if I was to take my data and I was to project it on different planes, the one that my data is most spread out on is what PCA considers the most interesting directions. Okay. Now, now when you're studying a method like PCA and when you think about that, you're like, oh, that's an interesting assumption. When might it not be true? Okay. When might that assumption be violated? Because if you think about when it's violated, that could be the opportunity to develop a new method to fill in those gaps. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. So, um, someone put it, okay, awesome. Um, so it turns out that in a lot of biological data, uh, the top principal components, so that's what we call the, the dimensions or the directions that have the most variation, sometimes they're actually not the most interesting things to look at. Um, so for example, uh, I'm actually gonna go forward. There's actually a, uh, okay, I'll just show an example here. So sometimes let's say you collect all of the genetic data that I talked about before, and you want to, for example, understand different subtypes of patients in your data. So you wanna say, okay, this is a cancer patient. This is a, uh, you know, a different kind of cancer patient. This is breast cancer, liver cancer, and so on. Now. If you actually do PCA, it turns out that your data, uh, the PCA will find not so much the cancer stuff, it'll find things like the age of a patient or the race of a patient, because these are the dominant sources of variation. 
Like if you're black versus white, if you're Arab versus European, that's going to have a much bigger effect on your genetic makeup than the different types of oncogenes or different types of you know, genetic variations related to cancer. And so you have this kind of background noise that is just much bigger than your signal of interest. Does that make sense? Okay. So again, feel free to ask me any questions. Just unmute yourself or ask in the, in the chat. I'm happy to answer them. Um, and so I remember seeing this quote in a paper that I was reading that PCA is often not very useful, not very useful in identifying subgroups in biological data because dominant principal components correlate with artifacts. So I started discussing this with my advisor and we came up with a project that was designed to, to, um, designed to fix this problem. Um, and the basic idea that we had was, let's take two data sets. So we have our main data set that we're calling the target data set. And this is, has my signal of interest, but it also has some like confounding or background noise, okay? So think of this, let's say you're listening to like, um, uh, I don't know, some um, audio or something. You have your signal of interest, but then you also have your background noise. In the background, and then you have another data set. So you have another sound file that only contains the background noise, okay? And the goal of contrastive PCA is let's figure out what is enhanced in your target compared to your background, okay? So rather than just looking at what is dominant in your target, let's take a look at kind of the difference, okay? Let's use the background as kind of a contrast to figure out what are the important sources of signals in your target data. Let me pause here. Does the approach make sense? Does the method make sense? And most importantly, does the motivation make sense? Can you please explain a little about little bit about direction of interest? I think I didn't get that. Yeah, that definitely. Be... Definitely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So for that, let me actually show you the actual paper itself. Um, uh, yeah, and I'll also repeat what I said because that will. Okay, so if you go to the paper itself, we have a simple figure that kind of explains this. So. When you do something like contrastive PCA, or even when you do regular PCA, you're going from a high dimensional data to a lower dimensional data. So let's say I have this two dimensional data here. Okay, this is just two dimensions. Remember, typically you have hundreds of dimensions, but here I have just two dimensions. If I do PCA on this direction, uh, on this data set, I get this direction, okay? Why? Because this is the biggest source of variation. Okay, like you can see um, the data is most spread out in this direction, in the red direction. But if the target data set is the blue data set and the background is the gray, well, you'll notice that compared to the gray data set, the blue data set actually has more variation in this green direction. So I'm like, I'm like saying, okay, what's, where is, how does my data look in the blue that it doesn't have that sort of pattern or that structure in the background data set? What is different about my blue data set, okay? And this, time, this often gives me a direction that I can project the data to to discover structure. Okay, imagine projecting the blue data onto this green line and you'll see a cluster here and you'll see a cluster there. Okay, that's kind of the, the method. It's okay if, if, the, if, if you still have questions about the method. I don't wanna to go too much into the method. You can find the paper on your own time. But the reason I wanna bring it up is because I wanna, um, the, the key point, which I think someone uh, mentioned in the chat is yeah, finding, finding a place where an existing method does not work well trying to fit that in, uh, trying to create a method to fill in that gap, exactly, okay? So um, let's keep going. So the next thing I wanna talk about is once we had developed the main idea of the method, then we started thinking, okay, well, how do we actually um, you know, uh, validate our method? How do we actually test our method to make sure it works? So this here was a lot of um, work that I remember doing. Like I remember like looking at many different data sets and trying to find data sets where our method worked really well. And, and that's actually a very important point, in especially in machine learning research, is that once you have a method, it won't necessarily work in every data set. Okay? Every data set has lots of noise and you know, interesting artifacts. So you sometimes have to do a little bit of data set hunting. <laughs> um, you have to find the data sets that showcase your method really well. And this isn't you know, dishonest or underhanded or anything like that, because your goal is to help people understand where your method works well, and then also discuss where it might not work so well. 
Um, and so we found different data sets where PCA would not really reveal too much structure in the data, but contrastive PCA would reveal two very distinct clusters or multiple distinct clusters. Um, and we found this, we found a bunch of different biological data sets where this was the case. Um, and after doing that, we then stepped back and we were like, okay, let's analyze our experimental results and let's figure out how to make this a more general technique. Where does our method work well and where does it not? So we kind of stepped back and communicated to our audience that if you have these kinds of data sets, you should try contrasted PCA. Okay. One thing after we did that, uh, I'm just going to go forward. Um, so uh, after doing that, um, one important thing that we realized was that although our, um, we had some good experimental results, they were all very biological. Like they were all, they were all from the biomedical kind of domain. And, and so the problem with that is that, you know, the general machine learning community may not be able to understand your method. And so we decided to create one example, which was actually a general machine learning example that anyone who's done image classification will understand. And that example was that we took a data set consisting of the digits one and zero, okay, from the MNIST data set, one and zero. And we were like, let's put background images of grass behind the, behind the data. So you can see here, we took the digits and then we put images of grass behind the data. And then we performed PCA. And if you perform PCA, what ends up happening is that the digits, and if you project it down to two dimensions, this is what the data points look like. The zeros and ones don't really cluster into two different groups. And the reason for that is that PCA isn't really picking up the digits at all. It's picking up the background images. And the background images contain a lot more variation, contain a lot more signal than your simple digits one and zero. However, if you have a background data set of images of grass, and it doesn't even have to be the same images of grass, it could just be other images of grass, and you do, and you do P contrastive PCA, then you end up finding two distinct clusters again, of zeros and ones, because now your, the method is looking for what is the additional signal that's present in your target data set that your background data set doesn't have. So it's able to like filter out all of that contribution from the graphs. All right, does that make sense? Okay, awesome. Um, so what I wanna end by talking about is, I'm not gonna talk too much about the algorithm because again, it's not too relevant for us. Um, the last thing that I wanna mention is, uh, is we ended up releasing not just the paper, but we actually ended up releasing all of our code um, publicly. And surprisingly, you might have seen this in your own research, but a lot of papers don't release their code. Um, and if they release their code, it's not very usable. But I remember we actually spent a lot of time making our code very usable. And that ended up making a very serious uh, um, impact on our paper. We ended up getting uh, you know, more than 100 stars on GitHub, 30 different people forked our repo. And uh, we ended up getting a good number of citations from this paper, more than many other papers in this journal. And I think a big part of that was because we made our code super available. Um, and we even made a little GUI that you could use to play around with it and so on. And so um, one of the things that I recommend for you guys is really make your results available and make your code available as well. And sometimes you might think, well, okay, what if people find out problems with my code? What if people find out problems with my method? Well, that'll just plant the seeds for more future papers to build off of your paper. Um, and so don't worry about that. And they'll cite your paper too. <laughs> so that's something we noticed with our, with our work as well. Um, so kind of to summarize, um, look for gaps in existing research, uh, develop methods to fill in those gaps, hunt to figure out the right data sets to showcase your method. And then once you have that, release your code, make it reproducible, make it accessible. And um, hopefully many people will discover your research and then we'll cite it and that'll help build, build your publication profile. All right, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you very much for listening. I think I'll, I'll end here and then we can transition over to maybe Muhammad. And then if you guys have questions for me, I'll stick around obviously for the Q&A at the end, you can ask questions then.